Hi folks, Pastor Mike Spalding here with my good friend and big brother. I am Pastor Casper, and we're here together to encourage you to keep listening to Deception Detection Radio, because we're both on this network with our individual shows. Yes, and yes. And we're going to be doing some things together as well, and I'll just say no more. Hey folks, tune in Deception Detection Radio, some of the best programming in Christian talk, news, encouragement, and Bible studies. God bless you. God bless you. in the sky, gazing far into the night. I raise my hand to the fire, but it's no use, cause you can't stop it from shining through. It's true, baby, let the light shine through. If you believe it's true, baby, won't you let the light shine through for you? Deception Detection Radio. I'm Kay. And I'm Chad. We pray you all had a blessed week. Tonight, it is our pleasure to welcome Joe Jordan to Deception Detection Radio. Joe is the president and co-founder of CE4 Research Group and works with MUFON as a field director in South Korea. He helped discover the amazing information that alien encounters can be halted by invoking the name of Jesus and that serious walk-the-walk Christians do not experience these encounters. This led Jordan to seriously investigate the claims of scripture, and he eventually became a Christian as a result. Welcome, Joe. It's wonderful to have you joining us. Thank you for coming on. Hey, thank you for having me on. Well, we are really excited about tonight. We have been talking nonstop about it. So let's go ahead and uh, do the opening prayer, and then we'll get started. Everyone ready? Okay. Sure. Yes. Okay. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this evening and and bringing us all together. Bless the fellowship that we are about to to have. Let it edify the listeners and and just open their hearts, Father, and lead us. uh, Make your words our words and soften the hearts of the listeners and us so that we hear every word that is divine from you. We thank you for being with us. Please protect all of our equipment and us that nothing may interfere with it. And bless our audience and look over them also. In Jesus' mighty and holy name I pray, amen. Amen. Joe, um, is there anything that you'd like to add uh, to your intro? You have done some amazing things, and we would like to know how you got involved with all of it. Wow, that's a. That's a good one to start out with. <laughs> a loaded um, question, right? <laughs> a loaded question. Actually, all of this began for me back in 1992. Um, at that time, I was working at a world-famous boat company in Central Florida, right there near the Space Center, where I was living. And I was just an average working guy, um, didn't believe in God, Um pretty much fell for the whole evolution line and everything and wasn't even interested in the idea of UFOs and aliens at all. I was a sci-fi fan, you know, growing up. Um, I used to live overseas when my father was in the military and we didn't have TV a lot. So reading was the big thing, you know, in my younger years, more than television. And I used to read a lot of sci-fi books. You know, sci-fi books are great for escapism. You know, you can imagine as you're reading the books, being in these places, you know, in other planets and other worlds. And But you know all along that you're just reading fantasy. You know, it's fiction. Um, in 1992, I had an opportunity for a vacation trip to visit my brother up in Alaska for a week. And as I was flying out of Orlando at International Airport, Uh, To go to Anchorage, where he was at, I saw that it was going to be a 10-hour flight, and I wanted to pick up something to read. So I went to the local kiosk there in the uh, airport looking at some reading material. Didn't see any magazines that caught my attention, so I went to the book section and 
primarily the fiction section and didn't see what, anything I really liked and went to the nonfiction section. And there's this book that looked like a sci-fi book, but it was in the nonfiction section. I picked it up. I looked at it, turned it backside over and read what it was about. And it puzzled me because this, everything about this book was science fiction except that the information on the back talking about the book was saying that this was a scientific investigation of an event that happened in 1947 in Roswell, New Mexico. And it was about the so-called UFO crash in Roswell uh, of that year. So being that this book puzzled me in the way that it, you know, it appeared, I decided to go ahead and purchase it and read it and see what it was about. And I spent that week, any spare time I had on my trip, I was reading the book, you know, as quickly as possible. I wanted to understand what it was about. And by the time I got to the end of it, it just opened up doors for me to explore uh, and try and understand this whole idea of UFOs and flying saucers as being real compared to what I believed that they were fantasy. And that led me to a number of people to ask questions to and uh, try to gain information from, which eventually led me to MUFON, the Mutual UFO Network, which was the largest established um, clearinghouse for UFO research in the world uh, at the time. Uh, many other ones had been up around you know, prior years, but they had fallen by the wayside. MUFON's the last big one that's, that's still in existence. And as I became involved with MUFON, I found that I could become a actual field investigator doing the research myself with uh, the support of a large organization and a large database to work with. And as I became a member and became involved as a field investigator, I was eventually introduced to be um, the opportunity to be a state section director for the county that I lived in there in Florida called Brevard County, which is where the Space Center was located. And, you know, for somebody that, that decides to get into this field of research, you know, I, I, you couldn't have picked a better county to be, <laughs> to be located in to be a state section director, uh, being that it was at the Space Center area itself. And believe me, people were actually seeing things around the Space Center, even though it was one of our, and still is, one of the highest protected and, you know, areas in the country as far as security. So as a state section director, that was an opportunity to build an organization for my county, you know, underneath of me, uh, training up and hiring field investigators and being able to go out on calls that would come in for sighting reports. Most of them would come in through the, uh, the newspaper or the sheriff's department or police department because they didn't want to handle them, you know, and if they knew we were there and that we would take the calls and they'd pass them on to us. And that's what I did the first few years um, becoming involved in MUFON. But part of being a state section director, I was also responsible for, setting up and having monthly meetings for the public uh, to be able to share information about MUFON uh, to the public, to be able to also bring them in to a meeting, to be able to get them uh, interested in the organization and join the organization. Because MUFON is a nonprofit organization, and uh, the, the money that they use to be able to do the work they do either comes from um, – you know, subscriptions to their to their journal membership uh, or donations from people that, you know, are interested in supporting the organization. So the membership drive was always there to, to get people to, you know, to come in and, and become part of it to help fund it. But when you open up a, a meeting and you put a sign on the door that says, you know, free UFO meeting, uh, you get some really strange people show up. <laughs> <laughs> Believe me. <laughs> and, and it became quite interesting to hear their stories. You know, it was fascinating, actually, to, to listen to some of the things that people were reporting. But what caught our attention was one type of people that came to these meetings. 
And these people, I first started recognizing them as being, um, trying to find the right word, <laughs> distraught. Um, um, I don't know. They, they weren't very happy people. And I would, didn't understand why they were that way until I started taking the time to actually listen to their stories. And these people are the ones that had claimed to have had the alien abduction experience. And this was an experience that happened to them against their will, um, without any advance warning. And it left these people, you know, really disturbed. Uh, many of them, later we realized they were suffering from, from you know, the effects of post-traumatic stress syndrome because of this. And I started listening really intently to the stories and realized that these people were talking about an experience with beings that were supposedly behind the UFO sightings that people were having, that we were doing follow-up reports on. It was like, you know, chasing our tail. We're always coming after the fact to the sightings. But it, it, it appeared to me that these people were the front line of this phenomenon, the abduction experiencers. So I asked my field investigators working with me if, you know, if they thought maybe we should focus our interest more on the abduction experiencers, being that they seem to be the front line. And maybe if we're going to really find answers, that would be the area we need to look in. Now, we didn't stop doing UFO investigations. We just increased our research into the abduction phenomenon and working with the abduction experiencers. And that's where I came across some really interesting things. Uh, one, it, not only were these people, you know, distraught, but at the same time, they had developed some kind of spirituality um, in their nature because of these experiences. And that puzzled me because I didn't understand the connection to this phenomenon to have, you know, a spiritual aspect to it. And I wanted to explore that a little more. And being that I was an agnostic humanist myself, I didn't believe in God coming into all of this. And as I started exploring it, I, I realized what had happened here is um, there was a whole another group of people that were able to sort of help these experiencers uh, when they were looking for help. And this was the metaphysical New Age group of people. Uh, there's a lot of people in the world that are involved in New Age and metaphysics. And when nobody else was there to help these experiencers, these people were. And they really were trying to help them, but there was really no help they could actually offer them. Um, they were, you know, they were trying all different types of ideas, but nothing seemed to really work. And it wasn't until 1997 that I came across my first experiencer that said that he had been able to stop this experience, you know, in a certain way that led me to where I'm at today in the research. But when I first started looking at these people and the, you know, how they were bringing this spirituality into this phenomenon and their experience, I had to explore that deeply to understand it. And when I did, I actually became involved in the new age and meta metaphysical realm myself and spent about four years actually um, wholeheartedly into it and practicing their ideas and, and things that they were into. Um, that was my first real connection with uh, any type of spirituality at all. But in 1996, the uh, fall of 96, I uh, came across a couple strange cases I was working on. And one of my fellow researchers, uh, a girl that was working well, this happened to be my girlfriend at the time. Um, she was a professing Christian. I wasn't. But we still worked together and we had a, you know, a, a pretty good relationship. And she pulled me aside one day and said, you know, I see some strange, dark things with this, this experience that you're working with. And I don't feel that you're very protected going into this realm. 
and I'd like to offer you something that would probably help. And I asked her, I said, well, what do you have? And she brought out the Bible, and I said, oh, no, no, no. Um, that's got nothing to do with this phenomenon, you know. But she said, I believe it does, you know, and, and, I, and I want you to look at it. And I said, no, nah, you know, we, we talked about not crossing our beliefs here, you know. And she says, wait a minute. She says, I'm trying to show you this because it has something to do with this phenomenon. And you've told me and everybody else that you're the most open-minded, objective investigator out there. And I'm going to call you on that. I want you to take a look at this. And I said, all right, you got me. So I sat down, gave her a few minutes. And in that few minutes, she shared with me the, the gospel message of the Bible like I had never heard it before. I mean, I grew up in a church with my parents, but did not believe. But I never heard it presented the way she did it to me at that time. And she offered me a protection that was beyond the crystals and gems that I was carrying in my pocket as a new ager. And I chose to accept what she was offering me, understanding now that, yeah, I needed some protection in this realm. And in 1996, at the age of 42, I became a, a believer and follower of Jesus Christ. Praise God. And, yep. And I wanted to turn away from this phenomenon at that time. I realized that this is probably something I should not be involved in as a Christian. And the more I tried to turn away from it, the more God kept saying, nope, you've got a job to do. And I didn't understand what that job was right away. All I understood was he wanted me to take what I had learned back to where I came from. And I would tell God, I can't do that. I can't take the Bible to these new age metaphysical people. They don't believe it to be the inerrant word of the creator of the universe. You know, I said, I need something better than that. And, you know, being a new Christian, I didn't know you talk, you don't talk to God like that, but maybe you do, looking back on it, because he did give me something better. Actually, he told me I already had it. I just didn't know I had it. And what he was telling me, go look at what you already have. We went back and looked at our testimonies at, of experiencers that we had recorded and lo and behold, there was one as we were watching it that we had recorded six months before during an interview with him. And, you know, we didn't even remember any of the conversation from that six months before. It's like the guy told us his story, but we didn't hear any of it. But the camera captured it. And when we listened to it again on that camera, there it was, the one thing that was the most powerful information we had ever come across. And that was um, my friend Bill D, who, during his encounter, called on the name of Jesus Christ, and it stopped abruptly. And I, when I heard that and finally heard it, you know, and I, I think it, I needed to be a believer to actually accept what I was hearing. Because I now was, I realized that's powerful. That with the word of God, I can take back, you know, because there's a testimony of the word of God. And that's what's important, you know, as a Christian, when we share the word of God, if, if you share the word of God and the gospel message with somebody and they turn to you and they go, oh, that really sounds great. But what has it done for you? You know, if you don't have a testimony for how it's helped you and changed you, you may as well have shared a book like Moby Dick, because that's a good book, too. You know, it, it's about our testimony. Our personal testimony is the testimony that the Word of God is actually real. And that's what I was given in this research, is the testimony that it's real. Not only could the, the name of Jesus Christ and the authority of with it stop this experience and stop the beings that are behind the experience. But it also showed that the word of God is what it says it is. And that's where I've been working with is I started um, taking these testimonies 
and looking for these testimonies because they started coming in once I started publicizing it, that I had come across this. And over the years, I've worked with, oh, Jesus, probably over 600 cases um, where people have been able to use the name and authority of Jesus Christ that have had this abduction experience and stop this experience, stop it from happening to them. Joe, are you going to assemble all this and put it into a book? <laughs> um, I tried that one time, and uh, it didn't work out very well. I'm not really a writer. I'm a speaker. Um, I can't even write my own sister and brother you know, an email to say, hey, <laughs> I'm just seems like a, everything comes to a halt when I got to put pen to paper, you know? Well, I just figured uh, that because there's an author named David Paulides, and he has a series called Missing 411, and that's mm-hmm. similar what you what you're doing. I mean, that's the thing is he puts these uh, writes the, finds these odd cases, and he basically puts them into a book and puts them out there. And like I said, with you, as much as you've uncovered, you probably got enough there for at least two or three books. Yeah, I had a chance to listen to him at a, at the conference at the uh, symposium. For Mufon, he was there speaking, and uh, fascinating stuff he has. And uh, yeah, I, he's got a book. I, I would love to be able to put a book together. I think there's a lot more that needs to be in there than just the testimonies, and that's the hard part. I'm still trying to, you know, put it together in a in in a, in a sense that where it makes sense, you know. Well, I know, um, I know someday. I know tons of authors, so if you ever want to be put in touch with any of them and get some pointers or tips or anything like that please let me know i'll, I'll make it happen probably more of a ghostwriter is what i need make it easier but i'll get to that point right now i post them on the website and uh, i've got a facebook page running ce4 research on facebook uh, a lot of the new ones come in it's easier for me to post them on the facebook page for my followers to see them up there what is the most mysterious and gripping um, incident that you have investigated with MUFON? Um, Well, most of the investigations I do with the abduction experiences aren't with MUFON. Um, I'll tell you my relationship with MUFON. Uh, When I first got into all of this UFO research, it was with MUFON as a field investigator um, researching unidentified flying objects and reports that came in on that. There really was not a format for working with the abduction experiencers back when I started with MUFON in the um, mid nineties. Um, there just wasn't any way that we were, that they could set up and do a, a training to work with these people or anything. There wasn't a way to capture the the information. They, they just weren't there yet. They were working on the nuts and bolts aspect of this phenomenon. Over the years, more and more people with MUFON have worked in the realm of the abduction experiencers. Uh, now they have an experience research team that handles everything on the abduction experiencers, but I've not been asked to be part of that. Uh, is, is I do that, know the... I was, the I was, I'm sorry, I was just going to ask, is that uh, Chase uh, Klowetsky? No, Chase is actually over uh, field investigations, and I know her very well. And um, the Kathleen Martin is over the experience research team, and uh, Kathleen and I see things completely different, <laughs> and she's not very open at all to what I have to share. So I've been kind of left out of being able to participate in the MUFON side dealing with abductions. That's why we formed CE4 Research Group in the first place. Because back then, when we first started in this, we wanted to be able to have an organization that we could set up to capture everything that we were looking at. And we were always committed to sharing it publicly and for peer review, which we've done through the website and through any publications we've been able to get out there and any, you know, all of our recordings we offer for free. We've never charged for anything, access to anything we've done. Uh, we want to make sure the information's available to whoever wants to look at it. Um, at the same time, anybody that's worked with the group 
uh, myself and anybody that's worked with me, I tried to stress that they become a MUFON member and become a field investigator status like we were in the beginning to show that we've been trained in the proper methodology of research, scientific research, and putting the work together. That way we can't, you know, it's kind of hard for them to say, well, these guys are just a bunch of quacks. Uh, well, if we're quacks, you're the ones that trained us, you know, on how to do this. So we try to keep the credibility of being MUFON members and MUFON investigators in our work. That, that keeps a, le- a level of, you know, respectability to what we're doing. So the work's always been there for them to look at, but they've never asked for it. But it's always been available. Had a question for you about um, Ben Mesrich. Are you familiar with him and his book, The 37th Parallel? I don't know that one. He, um, I believe it was him and his wife actually wrote the book together. They were both doing their own research separately from one another, and they noticed a pattern across the United States that, actually around the planet, to be honest with you, uh, that on the 37th Parallel, that was uh, basically this paranormal slash UFO highway. And, um, you know, basically things that fall within it are like the Pentagon, Fort Knox, Washington, um, the Kentucky Mammoth Caves, um, Los Alamos, New Mexico, Colorado's Mesa Verde, the Four Corners area, Aztec, New Mexico, uh, where the the Roswell crash uh, happened, uh, Grand Canyon, Death Valley, Utah's Moab. Uh, Canyon Lands National Park, and it says that outside the U.S., places like uh, Granada, Spain, um, Fukushima, Japan, and uh, even uh, the border between North and South Korea. That's interesting. Yeah, because uh, if I remember correctly, I think even, what is it, uh, Bigelow's, the place that he used to have the, what was it, uh, uh, Skinwalker Ranch. I believe that right. even falls on the 37th parallel as well, if I remember correctly. Yeah, it's an interesting relationship I see between all of those things. And that's something that, you know, I believe the enemy's using to perpetuate the deception even farther. You know, people ask over the years, uh, what do you think this phenomenon's about? If it's not about aliens, and, you know, if you believe it's demonic, and what's the purpose, you know? And Michael Heiser and I are both on the same page when it comes to the answer for that one. And it, we believe it's all about deception, and it's all about what it takes to make you believe. And the enemy has built this deception. You know, remember, this is following what Scripture says of the grand delusion that it would be so powerful that if it were possible, even the very elect would be deceived. Well, that scripture is telling us that this is going to be a very powerful delusion, deception. Not something simple that can be uncovered. And the more you get into looking at this phenomenon, you see that it's just like an onion. It's just layer after layer after layer after layer after layer. And the enemy has made this very, very hard to get to the bottom of. Um, there's so many aspects that branch off from the just the idea of aliens, um, but are still connected, but will keep you confused, you know. And some of it doesn't have any purpose in it at all, like having a relationship that people recognize for something like, like their book. You know, why is it that way? Well, we don't know why it's that way, but maybe the enemy's using that as just an idea for us to recognize, to make us go, hmm, you know, to question more of what's actually happening here. Do you believe that all aliens that people have came in contact with are are demonic, or do you believe in the possibility that some of them can be extraterrestrial? No, I don't believe that any of them are extraterrestrial. Um, I strictly go by the evidence that's been made available in everybody's research, and I also refer back to Scripture. Going back to Scripture, um, 
you understand that Scripture doesn't allow for any other life to be out there when you actually look at what it's saying. You know, it talks about the the heavens being made in the beginning for signs and seasons. Okay, it wasn't any talk of anybody else, other life being out there. Uh, working with my partner Gary Bates from Creation um, Ministries International, the one I worked with on the movie Alien Intrusion, um, he puts together very well. Where you know, it talks about the whole heavens, you know, groaning for the return. And it, it just we just don't see it in the scripture where it's allowing for anything else to be out there. There may be other life, but it's not going to be sentient life. Because what what would God be to have everybody else suffer for what happened here on this one planet, this one rock in space? You know, the fall of Adam and Eve, they affected the entire universe, but there, it can't affect other life. Otherwise, you got other life on other planets that had no possibility of salvation, you know, that they're doomed. In the end, it all gets rolled up, and there's a new heaven and a new earth. But they have no opportunity, okay? Christ didn't come to die a, a million times on a, dip, on a million different planets out there. He, he came to die once for us. So the whole concept of, of life being out there is is to take our eyes off the one true God. It's to get us to doubt God's word. The whole belief in aliens, that is the purpose of it. Because you've got to, if there is life out there, that can only happen if there's a long period of time of since creation. And I don't believe that we live on a, I don't believe in the billions of years or millions of years. I think scripture has given us everything we have to understand that this has only been a few thousand years. And working with the 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 research that Creation Ministries International has done, you know, it, it's easily to see that that what the scripture is telling us that happened in Genesis is what it says. Day one, day two, day three, not thousands of years or millions of years between those days. It's literally that was days. You're, you, the boring part of the Bible, the most boring part is reading those genealogies, right? Going through that so-and-so begat so-and-so right. begat so-and-so. Well, I tell you what, that's there for a reason, because that shows you the time period between Adam and Eve and bringing it up to the time of Christ. And that, if you lay that all out, which many researchers have done, you only see that fits in a seven or 8,000 year period. And Very to well believe said, in, yes. To believe in aliens, you have to believe in millions of years. So you're believing in something that goes against God's word in the first place. And that just opens a door. Well, God, did he really mean that? And as soon as you start saying that, then you can start doubting everything else that's in Scripture. And that's the purpose of this deception, to take your eyes off the one true God. People that become involved in this phenomenon that's exactly what happens to them. Thank you for answering that. I knew that was one of the questions that if it wasn't asked, I was going to hear a lot about that. But very well said. And I hadn't heard that about the genealogy. That makes so much sense of laying it out and being able to calculate um, a rough, rough estimate of the years. Sure. Wow. Chad, you said you had to, you were going to ask him about Travis Walton. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask you if you've had any experience at all with Travis Walton. I know you have with Whitley Strieber. Um, how do their? Uh, how does what happened to them? How do you? How do you look at that? What do you see? I see the same thing that I do in all the other experiencers, testimonies that I've worked with. These people, both of those guys actually, have, I believe, have had something out of them, most definitely. Um, I do not believe it to be extraterrestrial. I, I believe they fit the exact things that I've been seeing in the other work that I've done with other 
uh, experiences where it's a spiritual event. I had a chance to ask Travis a, a very key question that I, cause I had issues with Travis's. I didn't have any issues with Whitley as much as I did with Travis. I wasn't sure of what happened with Travis. If something actually happened or it was a misperception. And I think I got my answer this past year at the MUFON Symposium when he was speaking there. And I'm going to take you on a little trip before I answer that question um, on how I got to that. The keynote speaker at last year's 2018 MUFON Symposium in Philadelphia, which I went to, was Louis Elizondo. And Louis Elizondo is the... um, government official, retired government official that was the head of ATIP, the recent government UFO uh, research group program that uh, had been going on that nobody knew about until he came out and started, you know, he retired from it and um, started coming out and talking about it. And he's only limited on how much he can tell. But he's the same one that got involved with Tom DeLonge that his has that Academy to the Stars outfit where the government guy came out and a lot of physicists are now working with him. And what they're wanting to do is take the information that they can share and be able to promote it out there to show that pretty much the government did find something in their research into the UFO phenomenon. What they found, listening to Louis Elizondo, is is a signature of the UFO event, okay? In other words, a true event leaves a detectable signature that scientific equipment can pick up and record. That signature is a what they call a time-space distortion. Okay, don't let me lose you here. Now, I have to tell you that in basic UFO research, we all understand as, as investigators that 98% of what people report as an unidentified object, 98% of all reports is a misidentified, misidentified natural or man-made object, okay? They just misidentified it. Um, They did not get enough information when they were looking at it to be able to determine what it actually was. But it was either man-made or it was a natural phenomenon that they were seeing. The 2%, 1.5%, 2% of the ones that are left have a very strange aspect to them, Okay. There might be things that would appear to be paranormal in their appearance or effect as they're happening. That's the part we're talking about here. Those are the UFO reports we're talking about. Um, A couple years before, in another symposium I went to in Irvine, California, I kept hearing the people using some terminology I was not familiar with. Uh, I kept hearing him referring to, well, was that a real UFO? And I'm thinking, what do you mean, was that a real UFO? That makes no sense at all to even say that. I mean, you were talking about an unidentified object. And to say the words in that way, was it a real UFO? You know, was it a real unidentified flying object? Well, if it wasn't, then it's identified. And it took me a while to figure out what was happening here with these with this language. And it was because they they had a lack of words to to call this thing. And what they were trying to put words to is how do we how do we say what this two percent is that's different? Okay. The two percent that are truly unidentified. And that's what they're talking about. And this is that special parts that the government was looking at okay this is that percent that little two percent was the ones that they were getting a signature from and that signature being a time space distortion around the event okay 
Well, I started listening to that, and I'm going, holy smokes, these guys are talking about something that Christians know about. Hang with me here. A time-space distortion. So you have something coming in from somewhere into our realm, and it creates a time-space distortion as it does it. And it hit me like a ton of bricks. What this government retired guy, the head of that group, is telling us they found is the signature of a manifestation event from Scripture. Okay? It's a spiritual entity manifesting into the physical realm. That's what they're describing. And I thought, how do I prove this? And I had to go back and look at Dr. David Allen Lewis's information from his book, UFO End Time Delusion, from years ago. And there's a chapter in there called Flatland, where he describes, and Flatland's a story from the 1800s. But he uses it in his book to show the analogy of how he, these unidentified, the true unidentifieds, work. And why they're fuzzy on pictures and why they're sometimes on radar and sometimes not. Because they're not physical crafts coming in. They're not nuts and bolts crafts. They're manipulation of energy to give us the appearance of a craft. Okay? Remember, this is about deception. And what we have here are spiritual entities that have the ability to manipulate energy in, in our realm. But to do that, they have to come into our realm, and that causes that time-space distortion. You know, after I'm listening to all of this, here comes up that one of the next speakers, and it's a girl from, she was one of the school children from the aerial school um, incident in Zimbabwe, Africa, back in the mid-90s, where if you look at that story, the aerial school event, they had some type of experience happen to about 100 school children on a playground, where these beings and this object showed up. And if you listen to her story and with her encounter with these beings, she's describing the same time space distortion she was part of it because of her close proximity she was actually in it and then i got to really thinking you know i've come across cases like this myself i started putting all this together and then realized also that this is something that had been looked at years before by a researcher named jenny randalls out of england and she called this experience, this signature that people were seeing and having part of during a UFO event, called it the Oz Factor because of lack of anything else to call it. She came up with the term the Oz Factor. It's like when, when uh, the girl from The Wizard of Oz goes from reality to another, t another an altered reality. You understand? And that's what's happening. When these people have this UFO event and this time-space distortion is part of it to where they're part of it, everything around them goes completely silent. I'm talking if you're outside, and I've, I've talked to witnesses that have had this, where they've been outside where there's traffic noise, there's wind blowing the trees, you might have cicadas making all sorts of racket. You hear people talking, but as soon as the sighting happens, all of a sudden they're inside of this envelope of total silence. And it's like, and they'll tell you, it's like time slowed down. That's a time space distortion. And these people have been part of it. And we've been hearing about this for years, just not knowing what to make of it. Well, my question was getting back to Travis Walton. Did he experience that during his experience? I've never heard it in his story. So when he came up to talk last year, 
I waited all the way to the end of his talk because I've been to his talks before. I get all the way to the end for the question and answers. And I got up there and I got a chance to talk to him and ask a question. And I said, Travis, uh, I'd like to take you back to where you guys were in the truck. You're seeing lights through the trees, not knowing what they were. And then you came upon it and you stopped the truck and you got out. At that instant, tell me what you heard. Tell me what you were seeing. Tell me what you experienced in that particular moment of the experience. And he told me, he says, everything went silent. And I'm going, oh, my, he's describing exactly this same time-space distortion, this Oz factor that people have been recording over the years. But this was the first time I heard him say that because nobody had asked that question. And I finally had the chance to ask him. And he actually described it. And that confirmed to me that, yes, his experience is a true experience. I don't believe it's alien. I believe it's another one of these spiritual entity experiences. And the purpose is for deception. Understand that these people that have these experiences become messengers for these entities. Right? The rest of their lives, they end up being, you know, testimonies that they have these experiences. He's testifying that he's had an alien experience. He's also pushing the deception by doing that. But I actually believe that he's had the same demonic entity experience as all of the other ones that I've come across. Because what we're dealing with here is a spiritual manifestation into the physical. Not an alien manifestation. What's happening is most scientists are thinking this is a technology of some sort that aliens have to be able to do this. I don't believe that at all. I believe you, there's a science to it. There is an appearance of, of, it, of it being technology, but it's not going against any of God's physical laws that are put in place. Because the CERN, uh, the CERN reactor... Um, is trying to do the same thing. They're trying to create that time-space distortion in a laboratory environment because they know that this is a real thing too, but they just don't know what's behind it. I don't believe what we're seeing is a technology of any sort. I believe this time-space distortion that happens when these entities come into our, our dimension, our physical dimension, is actually their ability of their of them being angels understand yeah that made sense so you know what we're seeing here what we're seeing is the government has come out and disclosed that this is real in other words christians christian believers have disclosure disclosure has been given to us as Christians that this event is real and it's what it seems to be demonic in nature. The whole thing is a deception. We now have in our hands disclosure that everybody else is still waiting on because they're expecting disclosure to be alien, but it's not alien. We have everything we need right now as believers, Christian believers, to share that God is real, angels are real, they are visiting us, and they're deceptive, and they're trying to take our eyes away from the one true God. This whole end got, time delusion is, is happening. I'm sorry. We've got the weapon, too, to be able to yes. fight them. Exactly. Mm. Now, do you, you know the Brookings... The Brookings report years ago, uh, put out by NASA, you know, the Brookings report was all about what would happen to society if disclosure would happen. Okay. And the whole thinking all along for decades has been that anybody involved in the church would be turned upside down in their beliefs and their thinking and everything. And it would cause a lot of havoc 
if if disclosure was to happen that there was life on other worlds, you know what? It's all backwards. We accept it because it's not alien. What they're showing us is this is actually what the Bible says it is. The people that are going to be turned upside down are the non-believers. They're the ones that are going to be totally confused and totally turned upside down. The ones that have gone against God and against the belief in the Bible. Because we have everything we need to show that what we believe is real. Also, there's a uh, FBI document that came out in 1948, uh, document number 6751. And in that document, they were talking about these things. They were using esoteric terms. They said that anyone who's familiar with the locas will know these this terminology. That's good. <laughs> That's good. You know, Nick Redfern, a uh, secular writer, he's written 20-some books now in the you know, paranormal UFO field. Um, I've spoken with him at, a, at conferences now. He was at our conference in Roswell uh, that Guy Malone put on a couple years ago. And he actually wrote a book called Final Events. And um, Guy Malone, Michael Heiser, and myself are interviewed in the book. But the, the whole concept of the book is based off of uh, the story with uh, Reverend Ray Boucher, who was a reverend but also a state director years ago for MUFON. And he was approached by government officials secretly to question him because of what they had found in research into UFO studies. And it was something that they had found that it actually was a spiritual connection to this. And they went to him because he was a member of MUFON and a reverend at the same time. And he shares uh, in you know his whole connection with this experience with these government officials in Nick Redfern's book. And it's fascinating because it's another it's another piece of the puzzle that shows you that, yeah, the government's come across this and they know what they're dealing with. You know, there are people who know that this is not alien in nature at all. And I think that's what really scares them is because if it was actually alien, maybe there's some chance to defending ourselves. But if it's demonic in nature, they don't understand how to defend themselves at all. But yet we have that answer. All the testimonies that I've been able to share for all these years show that we have a defense against these entities, no matter how powerful they seem to appear. And it's through that one name, through calling on that name and authority in that name of Jesus Christ. Yeah, and when you look into who these people are that were involved in a lot of what you were talking about because we've had nick on uh, a couple times and that was one of the first interviews i did with him was on final events and when you look and and that was what was fascinating is that the the, you know vast majority of these scientists they weren't christian uh the people that were members of the collins elite that were looking into that and that they traced everything back to area 51 um and that it had to do with uh, was it Jack Parsons and L. Ron Hubbard performing right. a, a ritual that Aleister Crowley had created um, through basically these uh, demonic seances and uh, they basically were trying to perform it, you know, uh, the Babylon working ritual. And that's supposedly yep. something, there was a rip in space time out there and that uh, right after that, and plus, not to mention, that was another thing I brought up with him, and I asked him, I said, did you notice all the stuff that was going on in 1947? I said, you know, it's like you had all that going on, then you had Operation High Jump, you had uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls being found, uh, Israel uh, becoming a nation, you know, even though it had wasn't fully announced until 48, it had already been agreed upon in 47, and it's just like, you start seeing all this stuff in 1947. It's just like bam, 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 bam. It's like that. It's like something. It's like something manifested. Something happened. There, there was something done that triggered something. 
you know, at the conference that uh, I was able to be part of for uh, the city of Roswell in 2008, uh, I had the opportunity to direct their conference, the city's conference for uh, the UFO Festival in 2008. And some of the information that I was able to bring to the stage up there um, with my co-speaker was the links between events with Israel in time and compared to different UFO events. And the reason we even brought that up is because when I first became a Christian and started looking at this research, I saw a similarity, not between, I wasn't looking at the aspects of the relationship between Israel and UFO events. What I was seeing was something more localized. Um, wherever there was a major revival going on in America, there was a UFO flap going on, counter to it. In other words, like wherever there were flare ups of people getting on fire for the Lord, the enemy would come in and, and bring their activity level up to where they were, you know, trying to bring people away from it at the same time. And that was that was fascinating as I was seeing that it was like little battlefields here and there, you know, inside of a major war, which that's what our this whole our whole lifetime is, is a war. You know, we know how it ends. You know, um, Jesus wins in the end and the believers with him. But the enemy continues to have all these little battles. You know, something I'd like to share with your listeners is uh, something we found in our research, I think, is that's most important. And it's questions that are still being asked today by the secular researchers that are looking at this phenomenon. And the question is, why does this happen to certain people? Why do certain people have this experience? And they don't have an answer for that. They're looking at all sorts of connections that may seem may be similar, like people that have a RH negative blood or something like that. But that, those aren't answers. Um, those are maybe some coincidences. But we did find answers for that question. Uh, in our research, and it wasn't just one answer, it was uh, three good answers, and it could be either because of one of the three or a combination of the three. But in dealing with the abduction experience, we found, one, people actually ask for the experience. Uh, I'll testify that I'm one of those people. I, I asked whatever was up there. I said, you know, show me something, you know. Um, and that's kind of what brought me right into the new age is I had an experience that sucked me right in. Um, we've had conference tables set up uh, for our showing our books and stuff that we have available, DVDs and stuff. And people would come to our table and the only thing that would catch their eye is the word alien abduction. And you'd hear them come right to us, not knowing that we're trying to help people. Uh, but quickly saying, man, I'd like to have that experience to know what it's about, you know, whether it's real or not. And we'd have to tell them, you know, you need to be careful what you ask for. Uh, so people do actually ask for it outright, you know, that want to experience it. The second group of people were ones that did not openly ask for it, but they were having the experience. And as we looked at all the things that they were involved in in their life and trying to make the connections, we saw that that connection, uh, the ones that had unknowingly opened the door to this experience. And when I say unknowingly open themselves up or open the door, is they were involved with things that the Bible tells us not to be involved in. Fortune tellers, the paranormal, you know, anything like that that they were already involved in opened themselves up to this experience also. And I believe the reason for that is because it's all connected by the same source. Uh, we see parts of the phenomenon overlapping. Even Whitley Strieber himself talks about um, interviewing somebody that had talked about his memory of being on a spacecraft and meeting a dead relative. You know, well, how does that work? You know? I mean, that's that's mixing ghosts and aliens together at the same time. So people that are 
dealing in things that they shouldn't be, they're susceptible to this experience. The third one was grown-ups coming to us and saying, you know what, I don't fit those first two. I remember having this experience since I was a child, six, seven, eight years old. They have memories, some strange friends or something or, that they can remember. Well, that one puzzled us for a while. And I, I prayed to the Lord. I said, show me the answer on this one. And he did. And I went back and I started asking the right questions to the people that have had these experiences. I went back and started asking them questions about what they remember from their family life. And I found the answer by doing that, because in every instance where these people that remember the experiences as children, the open doors were with the parents. And in scripture that I had been given on that was talking about the man being the spiritual head of the household. And if he doesn't keep the spiritual covering over his family, then they're susceptible to the wiles of the enemy also. And that backed that up right there. So we found three different ways that a person can become involved in this experience where that's, they're still asking that question. I was, gonna, I was just going to say that that's interesting because the second interview that we did with Nick Redfern, one of the questions that Kay asked was, she, we were talking about the black eyed children and sure. she had asked him, you know, have you noticed anything about your research that these people that have had encounters with them, were any of them involved in like the occult esoteric or new age or anything like that? And he said, yeah, he said, actually, it's funny you should ask that. He said, I did notice that there was about 15% of the people that encountered them had been, you know, either messing with Ouija boards or doing some kind of new age stuff, you know, just different things. And I was just like, wow, that's fascinating. I never heard anybody say that before. And then plus here recently, um, there was an article that just came out uh, about Whitley Schreiber, or Schreiber, I'm sorry. And um, it basically said that I didn't realize this at the time. I didn't know this, that, you know, he had written horror, horror books starting out, that he had done uh, Wolfen and the hunger and that they had been turned into movies and that they were saying that he was supposed to be like the next Stephen King. And then I, whenever I read that, I put on there, you know, when I posted on Facebook, I said, can tapping into dark corridors of the mind be an open door for demonic forces? Yep. Yep. Cause I mean, all that Most took, that, that all took place before he had his little encounter with the, with the uh, the aliens. Absolutely. And you know, I told you a little earlier about these people become messengers for this, for these entities. Uh, look at him. I mean, you go to one of his talks, he's promoting um, contact, you know, even with all that's happened to him and, and the, the, hor the horrific part of the experiences that happened with him. He's, he's still, is trying to get people to have the experience, okay? Look at Stephen Greer. He's doing the same thing with his CE5 stuff. He's promoting experience. How dangerous is that, you know, to get people to come in and, and actually open themselves up to having this experience? Yeah, they go out in the desert, and they literally pray to these things to come down and, and to, to appear before them. Uh, they will. I will tell you that. Yeah, it's it's highly fascinating, but yeah, like you said, that's the thing is uh, be careful what you wish for because you just might get it. You gonna say something, Kay? Oh yeah, I'm sorry, I hit the mute button instead of the being able to talk. Um, what's interesting is the fact that what you just said that the dark quarters of the mind, you it, it tells us in the Bible that we have to watch our thought life. And if we are thinking of demonic things or opening doors with our mind, then that's just as bad as doing it with the physical and opens us up to that. I believe that's true for sure. Interesting. And it's um, very concerning, especially when we look at the youth of today, the different things that they are engaging in and the parents are allowing it 
Well, I mean, look at regular TV shows nowadays. I mean, they they got stuff on TV that, you know, they wouldn't even play on cable TV back when I was a kid. And, I mean, it's like on regular TV now. You got, like, Netflix and all the other Hulu and so on. It's like you got everything at your fingertips. And, I mean, the the stuff that I see in there, it's like, you know, if if you don't, if you're not rooted in Scripture or anything like that, I mean, you... You, you can't handle some of that stuff because, like I said, it's just basically garbage straight into your mind, and it's just polluting your mind. Yeah, I agree with you. Totally. You know, that brings a, a thought to mind here that, you know, Jesus stand, says, I stand at the door and knock. But then you look at what the enemy does, and the enemy offers you a million different doors. Pick one. Pick one. Anyone. You know, and every one of them is a lie. They're, they're all a lie, but they're trimmed in gold oh, because yeah. that's part of the lie. They, he makes you think that what you're going to get is everything you ever wanted, when in fact it's the total opposite. Rob, yep. steal, and destroy. Rob, kill, and destroy. Wow. And that's what happens to people to become involved in this experience. In every essence. The one thing that I want people to understand is if you've had these experiences and if they are affecting your life, there is a hope. Nobody else out there is offering any hope for people that have had this experience. Even the the uh, the team they have with MUFON, you know, they they promote that having, you know, the support groups and all that, but who wants to be part of a support group? You know, nobody wants that. People want to be healed from these experiences and make them stop. You know, not just to go and tell your sad story with other people like it. You know, let's give them something that's real. Let's give them an opportunity to actually make it stop completely and, and not happen anymore and get their lives back. That's what the research that I've been doing shows that is possible. When people are able to stop this experience through a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, it stops, it terminates. There's no more life pattern of this experience. And and why they would not listen to this, I don't understand. You know, I'm still trying to grasp why people don't accept that, you know, um, that if it works, why not use it, you know? They're, they're so dead set in not accepting Jesus Christ that they'll go against helping people. And, and to me, I mean, I don't know. I, it, I say I don't understand it, and I really don't, but I was probably the same way before I became a believer. I just cannot relate to it anymore, and, and I can't put my mindset back there to understand it. Joe, I've heard... It said that people that invoke the name of Jesus, as you said, um, it will make them go away. But you have to have the faith backed up beso- behind calling for Jesus. Because if someone does it and they don't believe, they're not going to get saved from those demons, are they, right then? If there's no faith behind the call? What we're finding is... What scripture tells us, call on my name and, and, and I, will, I will be there to save you. Okay, we know that's what scripture is telling us. Even if you have a person who's not a firm believer, who's not accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, at that moment in panic, in fear, because they know who he is, because they've heard about him, they've read about him or whatever, and if you're an American, there's pretty hard to say that there's any American out there that hasn't heard who Jesus Christ is supposed to be. If in that moment of fear, you decide to call on that name, I have no doubt that he'll come to your rescue. That moment. The only problem is, what we're talking about is two different things here that I found in research. You have people that have been able to stop the experience while it was happening one time. And then you have those that have been able to stop it from ever happening again. And that's where a personal relationship with Jesus comes in. That's where total faith in him comes in. Building that personal relationship, making that 
commitment to Jesus Christ. That's where the lifetime changes. So is that is that the reason why these things don't ever approach Christians? They do approach Christians, and that's something that we found early in our research. And because I had to put a hypothesis question out there when we first got into this. And, you know, we wanted to do a scientific method um, research. So we said, we need a question. So since I was a brand new believer, the question that we decided on was, are Christians being abducted by aliens? Okay. That was the question we put out for our research. Well, we came back with two answers. Yes and no. And you, that wasn't what we expected, <laughs> but we did. We got yes and no. And the reason it's yes and no is because we found by going the next step after that, why yes and no, um, the next step showed us that there were two types of believers. There were those that made a commitment to Jesus Christ, but were not living their life and walking with Jesus. Okay. And then there were those that made a commitment to Jesus Christ and chose to change their lives and walk with him and follow the Bible and the ways that we're told to be. So we termed it the talk the talk and the walk the walk. Just lack of anything else to call it. And we found that the talk the talk believers were susceptible to the experience where we were not finding walk the walk believers saying that they had the experience. Okay. I'm here. It just got real quiet. Um, my question is uh, with what you just said that uh, about the readed encounters. Now I know Whitley has had repeated encounters, but has Travis had more than that one I have never heard. I don't know if he has or not. Because you said he believes either. that they are true aliens, extraterrestrials. Well, and I'm sorry, go ahead. Otherwise, I mean, I'm getting a breakup. Are you, Chad? Yeah, the it's cutting out there. Uh, can you hear us, um, Joe, Joe? Yeah, I hear you just fine. Okay, now you know you got to keep in mind too. Keep in mind too that some experiencers that I've come across, they may only recall one experience, but that one experience changes their lifestyle and their mindset and their their viewpoint of life completely to the point where they become testimonies of aliens being real that becomes their whole purpose in life there's no need for the, the the for them to be convinced anymore i mean if you look at it that way the enemy has already convinced them it doesn't need to be repeated events for them to be to become that messenger for them um, they've been sold out on just one major event um, it's the ones that i see that take a lot of work and that work that I'm talking about is there are a lot of experiencers where the, the first few experiences that they remember are very horrific in nature. And then somewhere along the line, the experience changes and they encounter more spiritual beings like the ones they term the Nordics. And at that point, they are being told that they were chosen for a reason or they volunteered for this mission or whatever they call it. And the, they become ambassadors for these entities. What do you make of Jesse Marcel and the area 51 incident with uh, parts supposedly from the craft and bodies? Is that a hoax? You're, talking about jesse marcel who was at the roswell crash site yes that's, up debris. yes um not a hoax um i don't believe that there was any 
alien spacecraft crash at Roswell. Um, I believe from what I've seen over the research I've done over the years that a whole lot of people want it to be. Um, but more and more you look at it, I think what you're seeing is a very good cover up of something that needed to be covered up because of um, what do you call it? Uh, national security. Uh, I'm pretty sure that what actually happened there was the mogul balloon because of the importance of that mogul balloon at the time that could not be um, let out of the bag uh, because of that time period. And the debris that came from there, I believe, is exactly what they had found. I think a lot of this was perpetuated to um, support the cover-up. And something about this cover-up that people talk about is the public is doing the work for the government is the way I see it. You know, the government's trying to keep secrets, okay? And there's a reason for secrets. It's for national security. To be able to develop defenses and, and, and weaponry to protect our nation and other nations that need protected. Because if you don't keep secrets, the enemy is going to get ahead of you in the game. And anything you build, they're going to have a counter for. This is that game of warfare that goes back and forth, you know. And, and it's all about the technology. So they're trying to keep the secrets the best they can. Area 51 was kept secret for a long time because they needed to develop some aircraft out of there advanced aircraft without the enemy knowing about it. And they did. The B-1 bombers and, you know, the B-2 and all of those were built and probably a major part of our UFO sighting reports because people didn't know they were being built. So I'm in favor of secrets. That's not a problem. Um, it, it, everybody doesn't have a need to know of everything that goes on. Otherwise, we couldn't get things done we need to do. Um so how do you keep these secrets? You got to have a cover story for them, okay? When people start getting close to uncovering them. Well, the whole UFO phenomenon wasn't wasn't put out there, I believe, by the military. It was put out there by the public. Okay? Back in starting back in the 30s and the 40s when sci-fi movies were putting all the crazy, you know, alien shows out there. You know, the War of the Worlds with, uh, that was put on the radio show, that whole stuff started way back then. You know, so people are wanting to see flying saucers, okay? So as soon as they were misidentifying things as flying saucers, I'm sure the government goes, hey, check this out. They think that our secret aircraft is a flying saucer. Let's help them believe it is, you know? So we're doing all the cover-up for them. Well, not us as Christians, but people who are believing this phenomenon. You know, you want to believe everything is a flying saucer. That's great for the government because that way you're not looking at what they're really building or you're not trying to uncover what they're really built, you know, trying to keep secret. So I don't think that at all that Roswell was any type of alien event. I believe that it was a perpetuation of the cover up. You know, that's why it's been so confusing. And the, the whole thing with the bodies, that's not been supported. Um, there's a lot of different theories. The Body Snatchers in the Desert, I think that one is uh, Nick Redfern's book. He gets into a whole idea of what could it have been. My partner, Guy Malone, does a great talk on uh, what Roswell could have been. And all of it pointing that it could easily be something other than what normal secular realm thinks it is as being flying saucer. Mm. We'll have to have you both on together sometime. <laughs> <laughs> Chad, did you have anything else that you wanted to ask? Well, I got a million more questions, but I, I'm pretty sure. I he, figured you would. <laughs> I'm pretty sure he's got a, a stuff to do today, but uh, we would love to have you back on um, uh, whenever you uh, want to come back. Oh, I'd love to. This is my best connection for continuing to work. I mean, over here in Korea, I'll give you this a little bit before we, we get off. 
Um, another red flag, I call them red flags, things that don't make sense and things that you should look at and go, hmm, why doesn't it make sense? And it gets you to, to realize that this is not what it seems to be, um, this phenomenon. When I was in the States before I came over here six and a half years ago to Korea, um, everywhere I went listening to the top researchers, they always tell you that, you know, this UFO alien phenomenon is a worldwide event. You know, it's happening everywhere. Well, now that I went everywhere other than just the U.S., that's not true. It's not happening everywhere. This is not a major thing happening in Korea. It's a barely a thing happening in Japan, you know, or any of the other Asian countries here. This is a primarily westernized and American phenomenon. There are people that are familiar with the subject matter that will give you a report from another country because they become interested in the subject matter. But let me tell you how this works. Whenever I brought this subject up here to a Korean, your average Korean, what do you think about UFOs and alien abductions? Their immediate answer was, I don't have time for that, and off they go. And after <laughs> After that happening many, many times, you know, Koreans do speak English here. Most of them do. Um, so taught in school. So it's easy for them to say, I don't have time for that. I didn't understand what that meant. I don't have time for that. What do you mean you don't have time for that? So I talked to my real close Korean friends that I work with. And I said, explain to me why I'm getting this response to this phenomenon. And, you know, this question. And they said, you know, we've read about that. We have books in our libraries, so they shared it in school, you know, about the UFO phenomenon. Um, there's some that are actually written by, you know, some books that are written by Korean authors on the subject matter. So they're educated on the subject matter. They know what it is. But when they say they don't have time for it, the reason they say that, first of all, it's true. Because... If you're a Korean and you're an, el you're an older Korean, you know, middle age or older, you're busy as a business owner or you work for a business, okay? And you're trying to be super successful. This country is all about success, okay? Not necessarily about being Americans or the best Koreans. They're about being the best in the world. And they're moving at it real fast with technology. So they're busy working, working, working many, many, many hours, either for somebody or running their own business or farming out in the field if you're still in that you know, part of the generation. But the younger generation, the ones in school, they go to school 10, 12, 14 hours a day, unlike American kids who have a hard time staying in school six, seven hours. You know, these kids are trying to be the best in the world. They want to go to school. They want to learn. They want to do extra schooling after hours in the evenings. They want to be the best. They're striving for something to be world dominant. Okay. And they know that competition's tough between their, their peers. So the time they have available to play on the internet and look at subjects like the UFO thing and conspiracy stories and paranormal is very nil. The only free time they have is, um, you know, for vacations or holidays or whatever. And they spend that time with core family, unlike a lot of Americans who kind of distance themselves from family as much as possible. The culture makes the difference here. So any time they spend outside, which is very big here, recreational hiking is huge, bicycling, hiking, biggest thing they do here in Korea. So they're outside, but they're not looking for anything to appear. They're not, their focus is not there. They don't have time for it. You go to Japan, which I've done about 20 trips over to Japan for my job since I've been here. I got friends in Japan. I've talked to them about this phenomenon. 
when I look at Japan, they're about three decades more advanced <coughs> than the Koreans are um, because they had a head start. Koreans were obliterated during the 50s and had to regroup where Japan was you know, earlier and they had more time and more support. Um, so I look at that advancement where I see the Japanese have, be- have become successful and now they're starting to relax a little bit and take time to look at these things. Because they've had the opportunity to take a little extra time and start looking at things like the paranormal and UFOs and stuff, guess what's happening? I'm getting reports out of Japan. I get a few experiencers out of Japan. But you go over to the westernized countries that have been successful for years and years and years and years and have too much time on their hands, the phenomenon's wide open. So to me, as a red flag, what I'm seeing here is this phenomenon is entirely based on how much time on your hands you have. What do you think about that one? That's pretty bad, thinking of all the wasted time. I mean, Americans, we waste so much time. Yes. But we complain there's not enough hours in a day. (laughs) <laughs> True. it makes no sense and you know isn't there a scripture about something about the idle, idle hands or the devil's workshop or something like that or there's an Playground. old quote about that playing around yeah and I think that's exactly what we're seeing here very well I mean you, you think of it that could be one of those doorways sure Any opportunity, anything uh, can be used against us if we allow it. You know, and and tagging that right along with helping people get free from this experience. um, You know, when I first started out in this, I was just documenting testimonies that people were able to be free, set free from this experience and put it behind them. That was my goal, was the whole thing, just to post the evidence of the testimonies. But once I started posting enough testimonies up there, and people were coming across the website, the next thing was people coming to me and saying, hey, can you help me? Well, (laughs) that was unexpected, you know. I did not expect to become, you know, um, I don't know, what do you call it, a counselor or whatever, to be able to start actually helping people personally, you know, but yet that's what I do now more than anything. Um, Because somebody's got to, you know, I was hoping over the years that we educate the church enough to where they would handle taking care of these people, you know, they had a place to go to and become part of in a fellowship. But it still is not at that point yet. Um, But it needs to be because there's You know, there's estimated that upwards of 2 million people in the U.S. alone have suffered from this experience and doesn't have an answer for it. And that's something that, you know, I'm hoping it shows like this will help out, you know, that I can educate the people. I go, don't think of this phenomenon as just some crazy fluke phenomenon that Hollywood dreamed up or something like that. No, this phenomenon, we have evidence now, (laughs) and even the government coming out and sharing their findings, that this is real. This is absolutely real. People are seeing something, but it's not what they think it is. We have an opportunity as Christians right now to take what the secular realm is believing in and turning it completely backwards on them and saying what you're seeing It's evidence that God is real, that angels are real, and God's word is real, and the name and authority in Jesus Christ is real. I hope that helped a little bit. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, I think at this point, uh, if we could get uh, you to tell everybody where they they can find you, how they can reach out to you, and... uh, and where all the information that has to do with you and your CE4 and MUFON and all that right now? 
Sure. My website is www.ce number four research.com. Still there? Yes, I'm still here. Yeah. And uh, you'll see the testimonies up there, the articles up there. And I also have a Facebook page, CE4 Research Facebook page. Um, you can also reach me by email. Please do. I'll give my email out. I have no problem. That's how people come to me asking for help. And that's CE4 President at Yahoo.com. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Joe, for coming on with us. Would you please do the honor of the closing prayer? Sure. sure. Heavenly you. Father, we Heavenly Father, we thank you for this great opportunity to be able to share this news that is a hope that's out there for these people. A hope through your name, a hope through a relationship with you, a personal relationship. An opportunity that people can see that this phenomenon is actually a truly a deception of the enemy. A deception that can pull them away from a relationship with you, Father. Help these people and your listeners understand that everything we've been able to show here tonight shows that you are real and your word is real. And that they have an opportunity that they can have a personal relationship with the creator of the universe. That is something far better and greater than thinking that they could meet an alien. Believe me. Heavenly Father, we ask that this message be reached far and wide through as many avenues and locations and connections that are able to be put out to. Heavenly Father, we ask for coverage over this radio station, this, the, this couple that puts this, these shows together. They give them the opportunity, the power, the strength to continue and bring the right people on to be able to share with their listeners the real truth and the real truth that can set them free. And we pray these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen. 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 Thank you again, Joe. We look forward to having you come back back on with us. And that's going to do it for tonight, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in. We pray that you all have a blessed week. Good night, everyone. Not everyone. Good night, guys.